See, a lot of guys, when they're young, they say that they want to be uh, they want to be a businessman, they want to be an entrepreneur, or some shit like that, right? And and they talk about it, but they don't really give it much thought. And it's actually important to figure out what you are, and insofar as the world of business is concerned. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about in this video. Now, spoiler alert: there are only three kinds of businessmen. There are builders, there are middlemen. And then there are investors. Th those are the three kinds of business people. This uh, heuristic has served me well over the years, and I'll explain it to you. There are men who like to build things. Either they build it from zero, uh, you know, and build it all the way to the end, or they build just sort of like pieces of the business and then spin it off and then move on to the next one where they do basically the same thing. Those are builders. Like guys like, um, I don't know, like, uh, like Steve Jobs. He's the classic example of a builder. He likes to build businesses or like to build businesses. You know, he, he did Apple, but then he did Next. And, and then he came back to Apple and rebuilt that essentially from scratch, right? That guy is a typical builder. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, there are investors. Investors are men, businessmen, who like to put money into businesses. Now, this is actually a rare breed, as rare as builders are concerned, or successful builders are concerned. Because see, most people, when they get money, you know what they want to do with that money? They want to either spend it or save it. They don't want to invest that money into a business because they're scared. They're scared and they don't have that personality to be an investor. It's a, it's a very specific type, as specific as the middleman. Okay, The middleman is the guy who brings people together to make a business. Okay, He doesn't build it and he doesn't invest, but he knows the different people to bring them, make them work together and create something out of it. The most famous kind of middleman are uh, investment banks. Because what are investment banks? Investment banks are essentially companies that look for projects that need money and they bring the investors, their client base, they bring those investors to these businesses and hook them up. That's what a middleman does. He brings parties together and, and makes them work together. He is not the only kind of businessman because there's a mistaken notion that all businesses is, is basically being a middleman. This is not accurate because there are builders and there are investors and there are three distinct types. Now, before you start figuring out what kind of businessman you are, you should ask yourself if you have the soul of a businessman or the soul of an employee. Okay. Now, th this is something that you have to face as soon as you can. And you have to understand who you are and not pretend, uh, uh, certainly not to yourself, that you're one when you really are the other. Okay, uh, let me explain. See, in our society, we, we sort of like um, lionize people who are entrepreneurs, people who are businessmen, right? We, we sort of look down on people who are employees. Now, what's an employee? An employee is a man who is selling his labor to the highest bidder. You know, he, he is good at something. It doesn't matter what he is. He could be just a, 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 a you know, a, a construction worker, or he could be, I don't know, like a high-end lawyer, or he can be like some, you know, genius at management. But he's an employee. You see, he's not a businessman. He, he's not an entrepreneur, if you want to put it in those terms. Okay, an employee serves and works best within a corporate structure of some sort, some pre-existing business. There are very rich employees, people like, for instance, Tim Cook, the current uh, CEO of Apple. He's an employee. He's not an entrepreneur. He's not a businessman. Okay. He works best for others within the framework, the corporate structure created by others. That's not to say that he is not a creative man. That is not to say that he is not very good at what he does. He's exceptionally good at, at it. And he's a very, very rich man by being an employee. But he's not a business guy. He's not a businessman, an entrepreneur, a, a self-starter. Because the difference between the employee and the businessman is that the businessman works for himself. He sees no point in working for somebody else. When he works, he's working for something that he owns, his own company, his own project. He's not working for another person and hoping that that other person pays him a decent wage. It doesn't work that way. And in my own case, for instance, I have always been that kind of businessman, that kind of entrepreneur. 
I cannot work temperamentally, cannot work for somebody else. I prefer to be a, a very small fish in a big pond, but be my own fish, as opposed to be being a very large remora fish for some other shark. You see what I'm saying? I mean, that's just me. That's just the way I am. And you have to figure out as early as possible who you are. And there's no sin in being an employee. There's no sin in just temperamentally not liking to be on your own, because that's the thing about being a businessman, a real businessman, a real entrepreneur. You're on your own. Nobody's going to save you. There, there, there's no career path. You got to make it up as you go along and you are on your own. You're like this guy with a machete chopping through the jungle, hoping that you find El Dorado, but that doesn't always happen. And in point of fact, most of the times it doesn't happen. It, it's just a way certain men are, and there's nothing inherently good or bad about it, okay? My brother-in-law, for instance, he's a brilliant man. I mean, one of the smartest men I ever met. Truly brilliant. And he was so smart that he figured out that he was an employee. At a, at a fairly young age, he realized that he just was not, he didn't have the soul to be an entrepreneur, to start his own business, to be a businessman on his own. He just didn't have that. That wasn't him. He's a very successful executive at a very large company. I have no doubt whatsoever that he is eventually going to be the CEO of this billion dollar plus corporation because he's that talented, that smart. But he is not a businessman. He is not an entrepreneur. You got to know who you are and a heart and no bullshitting, no fooling around. Okay. Okay, once you've figured out which one when you are, let's assume that you are a businessman, that you are a self-starter, that you do not want to work for somebody else, that you want to work only for that thing that is yours. Well, then you gotta figure out what kind of businessman you are. See, of those three types that I mentioned, the builder, the middleman, and the investor. See, each of them is just very unique. And, and you have to understand who you are in order to figure out which of these three you happen to be. You see, there are these guys who are just fantastic at, they know, you know, John Smith over there and, and Joe Doe over there, and he just brings them together and he says, you guys would be perfect together. And all of a sudden, boom, you got something new, a new business and it works and it works great. There are some guys who just have a genius for that. Okay. And those are guys who just know all of the players in a particular milieu. They know all of the people who are working on different projects. They know the money men, i.e. the investors. They know the builders, i.e. the guys who are starting up, making, building startups and what have you. They know everybody and they know how to put them together and bring them together. Now that's a skill. That, that's a remarkable skill and not many people have it. And finding the right middleman is really important if you're a builder or an investor. You know how you can tell a good middleman if they are the gatekeeper of a particular industry. It's not that he's going to be the biggest player. It's not that he's going to be the most successful player of, of any given industry. He's just going to be the guy, the guy, okay? Not the company, but the guy who just knows everybody, okay? He's, he's like, uh, how can I put it? Um, you know, at a, at, a, at a club, at a disco or something, you know, the, you know the, the promoter, the, the guy who knows all, everybody, he knows all the, the hot chicks and he knows uh, uh, all the guys who are just like, you know, willing to spend a lot of money on booze and partying and all that, you know, and he also knows all the good drug dealers and he also knows like where all the hot models hang out and he brings them together. He's the middleman. He, he's that guy. Think of it like that. Think of that personality, that type of uh, individual. Okay. Now the builder, who's, who's the builder? I'm, I'm a builder. Okay. Now builders tend to be obsessive. Builders tend to be the, that guy who has an idea and can't let it go. And he starts like building stuff on it. He has that idea and works on it. Now there are different kinds of builders, if you will. There, there are guys who, who come up with the idea from scratch. The, the, the guys who come up with a, with a basic concept, and build on it. There are others who are not very good at coming up with a basic idea, but when they see the basic idea, they grab it and run with it. Okay. A guy like Bill Gates, he, he's, he's like that. Okay. How did he work out with uh, Microsoft? Well, he didn't come up with windows. In fact, he bought it, but he was smart enough to realize that if he controlled the operating system, he could build a company that would own the personal computing market, right? Which is what he did. He, 
uh, realized that he couldn't really come up with the idea of an operating system because he, he didn't have the technical wherewithal at that point, but he knew some other guy who had. I forget the name of the guy he bought uh, the original Windows from, but he bought that operating system for something like fifty thousand dollars, and and the guy who actually invented Windows was happy as a clam because he is the guy who started it from scratch. He started Windows from scratch and built it, built this operating system. Bill Gates came along and bought it, turned around and said to uh, IBM, he says, "We'll give you your operating system, but you just allow us to license it to other people." And IBM fool said, "Okay." And that's how Microsoft started, right? Bill Gates was a builder, okay? He wasn't a middleman per se, and he certainly was an investor. Later on, he became an investor, and I'll explain how people can overlap. But my point, he built his business, and he had an idea, and he got uh, Windows, and on that, what did he do? He, he improved it, building on top of it, building and building and making it better and better and better. Okay? That's a typical builder. Okay? Now, let's look at investors. Uh, what's a typical investor? You see, investing is very interesting because, see, there are very few people on this earth who are willing to make a lot of money, take this money, and give it to somebody else so that they can take this money and build a business with it. It's a very unique personality, okay? It's almost like gambling because, in a sense, it is. You're just sort of like betting on somebody and hoping that that somebody has the wherewithal to, to do good by your money, right? But see, what happens is that a lot of times business people, uh, like builders for instance, they'll try to invest in something, but they, they will not be able to stop themselves from trying to get in there and, and work on that business that they're investing in. Uh, this happens to me, for instance, all the time. Lots of times I've tried to invest money into some particular business or some particular venture and tried to do a hands-off approach. I just put the money in and just let it take off on its own. But see, my, my builder's instinct doesn't allow me to do that many times. Many times I see it, I, I put the money and I see how they're working on the project and I say to myself, no, 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 you don't do that, you should do this. And, and I can't help myself and I start getting in there, mixing it up, because that's my mentality. I, I don't have the passivity necessary to be a pure investor. It's a unique talent and a very valuable talent, okay? Because a true investor can look at a business with equanimity, can look at the builders who are building the company, who are gonna be taking his money and, and investing it and building that investment into something more. Well, a true investor is able to look at a situation, look at the participants with equanimity and cool and total judgment. Peter Thiel, for instance, he's a classic example of that investor type. He's a guy who just sticks money in and leaves it alone. Oh yeah, he's going to give suggestions, of course, and he's going to uh, you know, brainstorm if need be, but he's not going to mix it up, really get in there, get into the day-to-day -day of some investment, because he has that equanimity, that ability that's almost passive of stepping outside of his investment and just looking at it. And of course, if he realizes that the company is going down the tubes, he'll yank his investment in a heartbeat. Of course, he's not a fool. But if he sees that the company is making a mistake but realizes that, oh, this is a minor mistake, he'll leave it alone. He, he won't interfere. See, that kind of equanimity is very rare. And a lot of times people confuse it with passivity. I tend to look at it as some sort of like, almost like Buddhist equanimity. Okay? As I get older, I'm acquiring it, as a matter of fact. Because a lot of times in things that I'm investing in now, I just don't have the, um, the energy, the time, or the interest to get involved. And so I'm just like sticking the money in and, you know, hoping for the best. And of course, I'm monitoring the situation. But, and if things go south, I will pull my money. But I'm not getting into the day-to-day. And I think that this is just a, a, a function of, in my own case at least, a function of just getting older and being more patient and, and having more experience and realizing a lot of times that I should just leave stuff alone and let them decant on their own. But anyway, uh, uh, rather than talking about my experience, let me continue with this heuristic, which I think is very valuable. Now, the middleman guy, now see, the, the middleman is, is key, okay? Uh, especially if you're a builder, because most people are builders. Most businessmen, most guys who want to start a business and really have the qualities to, to start a business and really run with it and make it happen. Well, builders, see, 
there are a lot of them and the problem is that they don't know where to get the money. Okay. I remember when I started uh, making movies in South America, that was my big problem. I didn't know where to get the money and it took me a while to figure it out. What I realized retrospectively is that when I started with my own movie businesses and movie ventures, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago, see, when I started that and I didn't know where the money was, is that it, it was because I didn't recognize who the middleman was. I didn't understand even the function of a middleman. And it was really weird because see, uh, I had some experience with investment banks. I knew people who were in investment banks, close family members, but I did not understand how it all worked together. Okay. It took me a while for, for my, my head to get over this idea that there are business people whose sole job is to put other people together and they don't actually do anything other than putting them people together. Okay. And, and it's, it's for me, for my mentality, my builder's mentality, it was really weird because like I said, in my own case, I've always been a guy who builds shit and the notion of a businessman who does nothing but put people together, it seemed weird and crazy. And I didn't know where to find such a person. Uh, it was a blind spot in, in my mentality. Okay. And, and that's why I'm doing this video. And frankly, I wish I'd seen this video, when, you know, 20 years ago, it would have saved me, I don't know about, I don't know, nine months, a year of just like going around in circles and not figuring out shit, but that's another problem. But the point I'm trying to make, see, figure out who your middleman is in your industry, in your business. Okay. In, in, in your milieu. Okay. That's the guy you want to go to if you're an investor or if you're a builder. Okay. Because if you're an investor, you want to go with a middleman who's, uh, um, I, I want to say prestigious, but uh, that, that's not quite accurate. It's not so much prestige as effective, an effective middleman. Okay. Uh, somebody who is used to putting people together, putting projects and money together and, and who's very good at doing it and who's very good at bridging the gaps between the investor and the builder. It, he's a rare guy. Okay. I mean, you really want to find that guy and, and hold on to him, build a strong relationship with that man because that, that figure, that middleman, that, that guy who knows how to not only bring two people together, but narrow the distance between the two, because there are always going to be distances between a builder and an investor where what the investor wants and what the builder wants, there's always going to be differences. And it's not merely an issue of negotiation. Okay. The negotiation of the, of the points of a deal. That's the easy part. Actually, the hard part is for both sides to understand the mentality of the other, to understand where the other is coming from. That's really hard. A lot of times, uh, a lot of times, a lot of business deals, potentially very good business deals fall apart because the builder and the investor can't figure out where the other works or, or how they fit together. Okay. They, they don't understand what the other's priorities are. Okay. You, you see what I'm saying? A, a good middleman, uh, will be able to explain to both sides what the other wants and sometimes outright manipulate. Uh, uh, one side or the other, or both sides in order to get the deal because the businessman, he, he wants his points off the new business, right? He wants to take his, um, two, three, four, ten 10 points or however many points he's going to get from the business. He wants those points, right? So he's going to make the effort. So when you're dealing with a middleman, go along with him, help him do his job. He's not trying to screw you. He is trying to bring the two parties together. Okay. Okay. Now, you have to understand if, if you're whenever, whatever you are, if you're, you're a middleman, if you're an investor or you're a builder, you have to understand your, your, your position and, and how you work. Uh, let me give you an example. See, I am very good at building things from scratch. I'm not so good at from building something from scratch, uh, uh, taking it to the next level of growth. Uh, I, it's, it's happened to me twice already that I have failed in terms of bringing along a more professional management. Okay. I'm really good at, at, at starting things up and, and getting them to a certain point. But that point is usually when somebody else should take over. Okay. Somebody else who's also a builder, but is more into management who understands the notion of professionally managing a company. 
One time, I basically, the whole project fell apart. And the second time, when I rose to my level of incompetence in this regard, my project, thankfully, was taken away from me by one of, a couple of my partners. They took it away from me and they implemented the more professional management and they built it into something better. Okay? And I got a check and that was great, but I, I wish I'd stuck around, but I realized retrospectively that I did not have the skill set to do that. And it didn't, have a, it didn't have anything to do with me being smart or stupid. It didn't have anything to do with uh, me, with a failure of my part. It's simply that I'm good at one thing, but not another thing. I'm very good at taking a company from zero employees to 50 employees. I'm very good at that. But taking a company from 50 employees to 1,000 employees, I'm not good at that because I don't have the management skill set, okay? And frankly, I don't have the management temperament. Because when you get to that level, you start needing to uh, you know, smooth things over with the different people in the company. You know, it becomes more an issue of diplomacy. And, and as you can tell by my videos, I'm not a diplomatic guy, right? Right. So yeah, I sucked at that. I sucked at that. And, uh, and that's only now that I realize it, okay? But, you know, the point I'm trying to make here is that you got to figure out, if you're a builder, what sort of builder you are, okay? Uh, and the same applies for being a middleman. The same applies for being an investor. Okay? Now, understanding who you are will help you because you will realize that you're going to be good at certain stages of a business. And once you cross those stages, once you reach your level of incompetence, it'll be smart for you to step aside and allow somebody else to take over and take the business forward, with or without you. But without you, potentially you just get paid off or with you, but you deliberately and consciously taking a secondary position in the company and letting this new guy take it to the next level. And, and there's no shame in that. On the contrary, it helps everybody and it will help you if you understand your limitations. In my own case, I did not understand the, my own limitations. In one case, the, the business out and, right, out and out collapsed because of it because of my failure to let go. And in the second case, I was pushed aside and I did not get the big check that I should have gotten. I mean, I got a good check, but I would have gotten a much bigger check if I played my cards better of knowing that, okay, I'm gonna take a, a secondary position here, but just hold on to my equity and let these other guys take the company from 50 employees to 1,000 employees. And I'll just sit on the sidelines kind of thing, just sit on the board and you know show up at the weekly meetings and that's that, right? But no, you know, I sort of like pushed the issue and they finally just decided to push me aside and they gave me a check that at the time I thought was pretty good. And later I realized if I'd just been patient and smarter, I would have gotten a check that would have had an additional zero to it, you know? And that's how big of a difference it made because that happens all the time. It happens because you don't know yourself. A lot of times you're only going to learn about yourself when you're actually doing something. So. Rather than do as I did, which is sort of like learn on the way, try to think about these issues beforehand, okay? Now, you always have to think to yourself that you will rise to your level of incompetence as a businessman, okay? There's this famous uh, Peter Principle, uh, it was big in the 70s, okay? That people rise to their level of incompetence. And it's absolutely true. It means basically that at one level, you're very good at your job. At a higher level, you're very good at your job. But then you go to the next higher level and you just can't quite cut it because you, you just reach your level of incompetence, right? Okay, so be always aware of that. And once you reach your level of incompetence as a businessman, you have to be thinking of getting out. You have to be thinking of selling out you have to be thinking that somebody else should take over, okay? Always be thinking of that way because that way you will not, you will, your business will flourish even if it's without you and you will maximize the equity that you've invested in your company, okay? Finally, uh, a last point. Whatsoever you may happen to be, if you're a builder or a middleman or an investor, always diversify, okay? It's very important because a lot of times, especially with builders, builders tend to focus on the one business and they go on and on and on and on about the one business. They don't diversify. They don't have at least one or two other projects uh, uh, you know, uh, in the wings. Okay? They, they focus on the one thing and if it works, great, they're a big hero. But if it fails, they're still like left with nothing. Okay? 
always have two, three projects at least. Okay, the, your primary and these secondaries. Like for instance, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs had several businesses going because yeah, he had Apple, right? But he also had Pixar. I mean, after he got kicked out of uh, 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 Apple, right? He set up Next, which was his primary business, but he also had Pixar, right? And, and Pixar was just his secondary thing, and he wasn't so hands-on with that. But the point is, eventually Pixar became so big that he sold it to Disney for a whole boatload of money, right? Or a boatload of shares in Disney. I do believe that uh, Steve Jobs became the largest shareholder in Disney, right? So y y you see what I'm saying? Never focus on just one thing. The same applies, of course, if you're a middleman or if you're an investor. An investor never invests in one thing. That's just stupid. An investor always invests in a portfolio of different projects, okay? Uh, because you want to have your fingers in a lot of pies for, this, for two reasons. Number one, if you have only one project as an investor that you're focused on, well, if that project goes up, you're going to be really happy. If it goes down, you're going to be freaking out. So it's going to be like an emotional roller coaster if you have just one project. But if you have 10 projects, emotionally, you're going to be much more relaxed. You're going to be able to look at each project much more coldly, more cold-bloodedly. You're just going to be able to look at this project and like, oh, it's up, and this other, oh, it's down. But you're not going to freak out every time it goes up and down, see? And also, of course, the second reason is that if you invest in multiple projects, well, see, if you invest in one project and it blows up, you're, you're shit out of luck. It's over for you. You're game over. You blew all your wad on the one project. But if you have 10 projects and one or two or even three of them blow up and, and just collapse and become nothing, well, so what? You've got uh, seven, eight, nine other projects that can take up the slack, you see? So, and the same thing goes, of course, for being a middleman. You always want to have multiple projects because the more projects you have, the more confident you're going to be. And this is a key issue. You see, when you have multiple business projects going on and one fails, you're not going to freak out. And therefore, because you're not going to freak out if any one of them fails, you're going to be much more confident every time you look at that business, every time you have any dealings with that business. You're just going to be more mellow. You're not going to be so stressed out. So always have multiple projects. Always. If you're a builder, if you're a middleman, if you're an investor, always. In, if you're a builder, of course, that, that's the hardest one because usually you need all of your focus on the one business. But don't be so foolish as to have all of your chips in one business, even as a builder. Try to have at least two other little projects going on at the same time, okay? Now, finally, this heuristic, okay, of, of builders, middlemen, and investors. See, this is, how can I put it, a broad brush of what businessmen happen to be. That there are builders, and there are middlemen, and there are investors. Now, you can be all three, okay? It, it, it's not that you're only one and you can't get involved in the others. No, of course not. And more to the point, sometimes at different ages, you're going to change. When he was young, Sean Parker was a builder. He built uh, Napster, right? But then he grew up a little bit and he became what? He became more of a deal maker, a middleman, right? That's famously how he got involved with Facebook. He got hold of Facebook and plugged in Zuckerberg with the different venture capital firms and whatnot in Silicon Valley and was a part of Facebook as their deal maker. And then later after that, he became a, a venture capitalist in his own right, an investor. He had his own money and he would uh, put it in different businesses, right? So Sean Parker is an example of somebody who's been all three things in his career, okay? So don't think to yourself that you're going to be locked in forever and ever in just one thing. Uh, think to yourself that as a businessman, you're going to be doing multiple things at the same time and you're going to be changing over time, okay? I mean, always think of it in those terms. That, that, that it's, it, you're not fixed, you're never fixed. And now a final, final note on, on being a, a businessman or being an entrepreneur, or being independent, okay? It's really hard and it's not particularly glamorous and you're gonna have lots of sleepless nights. You're not gonna be a happy camper, okay? I would venture to say that guys who are employees, they're usually happier, you know? They're, they're happier guys. They, they are just 
happier there because they got a steady job and they go there at nine in the morning and they go home at five and their weekends are their own and they're just happier. Okay, I would venture to say that people who are employees are happier. Yes, I, I would say so. Yeah, but see, in my own case, I, I just couldn't be somebody else's employee. Uh, it, it was just, I, I actually think of it as a, a failure of character on my part. I really do. Well, why a failure of character? Well, because it comes from the fact that I'm not very good at working with other people. Working with other people as my equals or working with other people who might be superior to me. Uh, for various accidents of my personality, I just could not stand having a boss. I never could. I, I just hated that. I hated it so badly because I always thought that the boss was incompetent. Okay, And, and it's because of, of flaws in my own character that I just could not work for somebody else. And so no matter how small the business, I would work on my own, even if it's just me. I just could not handle uh, uh, working for a boss. But see, it took me a while to figure that out, okay? Uh, I'm doing this video so that you want, who are watching this, you might be able to figure out who you are quicker, earlier, so that you don't make the mistakes I made, okay? Okay, uh, I don't know how this video came out. I hope it came out okay. I mean, well, whatever the fuck, it'll just have to do.